the introduction of the observer into this theory is fascinating because physics has had a, a slightly interesting relationship with the idea of an observer for a long time now. It's always seemed very dodgy the way that physics deals with the idea of an observer in quantum mechanics to collapse the wave function. Wolfram Physics actually promises to make the concept more precise in terms of the observer being what effectively imposes causal invariance and possibly reduces the multi-ray graph to a single thread of time. So could you say a little bit more about that, how the observer plays that role in Wolfram Physics? Yeah, absolutely. But actually, you, you skipped over, or you, you briefly mentioned something which I think is actually an extremely important and deep point, which is the role of the observer in kind of traditional science. Yeah. Okay, first of all, to relate stuff to what we said at the beginning, or towards the beginning, about computational irreducibility, part of the underlying assumption of theoretical science has traditionally been that the observer is kind of infinitely computationally sophisticated relative to the system that they're observing, right? So in a sense, when you choose to make a theoretical scientific model, you are sort of being sufficiently arrogant as to assume that your methods of analysis, your maths, your physical intuition, whatever it is, is capable of somehow shortcutting the computational process that the system you're trying to explain is actually doing. And of yeah. course, there are situations where you can do that, like, for instance, celestial mechanics or whatever. But yeah. there are also plenty of other situations where, as far as we can tell, you can't, like molecular dynamics. Yeah. I mean, again, it doesn't normally get couched in these terms, but I would argue, and, and again, this is, not, this is me essentially parroting stuff that comes from NKS, that the two most fundamental theories of 20th century physics, general relativity and, and, and quantum mechanics, one way you can think about them is that they both emerge as a consequence of being more realistic about the nature of the observer and the limitations of the observer, what the observer can and can't do, right? So relativity, one way you can think about the foundation of relativity is it's basically saying, you know, there are some things that observers can unambiguously know, like the causal structure of space-time, but yeah. then there are some things that observers can't unambiguously know, like, for instance, the ordering of space-like separated events in their reference frame. Yeah. That's something which no two observers are guaranteed to be able to agree upon. And again, so that's very kind of anti the traditional scientific view of the observer, but somehow by being slightly more realistic about what the observer can and can't do, we immediately get this really foundational theory, which is general relativity. Similarly, you know, quantum mechanics, one way that you can think about it, I don't necessarily think it's the most useful way to think about it, but one way you can think about it is that, you know, things like the uncertainty principle are a consequence, I mean, this is this is the basis of Heisenberg's microscope experiment and uh, the, you know, the Heisenberg microscope thought experiment and things like that, where you basically say, well, the observer, you, ha you have an observer and you've got a system that they're observing. And traditionally, we think of the observer as being kind of infinitely far removed from the system they're observing, that, that they, can, they can perform a completely independent experiment that's kind of isolated from both themselves and from the rest of the universe. And in a sense, quantum mechanics is telling us that that isn't true, that the observer is bound by exactly the same physical restrictions, physical constraints as the system yep. that they're observing. And in particular, in order to be able to make an observation of that system, they need to become entangled with it. And as soon as they become entangled with it, they become inseparable from it. And the state of them yep. and their observations is really deeply related to the abstract state of the system and blah, blah, blah. And again, so, you know, the formalism of quantum mechanics can again be thought of as a consequence of being more realistic about the nature of the observer. So, yeah, and then as you say, in a sense, Wolfram Physics, the Wolfram Physics project kind of takes that to, an, I would argue, its next logical step. And so this is, this is the place where I mentioned at the beginning that sort of one of the things that led to essentially the, the, the start of this project was this realization I had about how you could do these explorations without the need to impose a priori causal invariance on the rules. And that was based on a realization. So, you know, when I was reading NKS, it always seemed kind of ugly to me that we have to impose, because causal invariance is quite a strong restriction. Yeah. It's certainly not a natural restriction to impose. It's a restriction that you'd only really impose either if you wanted to make an efficiency saving so you didn't have to tree out big multiway systems, or yeah. if you were trying to kind of reproduce physics. But otherwise, it yeah. feels like a very arbitrary restriction. And I somehow never really, I don't know, it never really gelled with me particularly. And similarly, the explanation in the book, Stephen's kind of conjectural explanation of quantum phenomena, where the idea is basically that you could have kind of long-range pieces of the hypergraph that connected apparently distinct regions of space in such a way that, you know, the, the, so that you have long-range edges that don't correspond to, you know, the usual three plus one dimensional space-time structure, and that you could use that to kind of set up correlations that you'd need to, to reproduce quantum entanglement and 
violate bills and equalities and stuff. I, I don't know. It again seemed a little bit ad hoc. I didn't I didn't particularly yeah. like that as an explanation. So what what I realized was that actually we could solve both of these problems by again just being slightly more realistic about the nature of the observer. So let's imagine that the evolution of the universe is not just a single thread of time. It's a multi-way system where you've got different branching and merging events happening. And the universe is not causal invariance, right? Yet. There's no a priori causal invariance that's being imposed. Okay. Okay. So what is an observer? You know, again, normally we might think of an observer as being kind of localized to a single branch of the multiway system. That would be sort of the traditional, like, many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics kind of view, right? That you are an observer in one universe in the space of possible universes. Yeah. But what I thought was useful was to say, well, okay, let's imagine that's not really true. I mean, because if the observer is going to be described by the same computational rules as the system itself, then... You know, it's not just that the universe is branching and merging, but the observer is branching and merging, right? Their, their, their internal perception of the world is branching and merging at the same time. So you quickly realize that it's not useful, it's not accurate to think of the observer as being localized to a single multiway branch. Rather, the observer is an extended object in the multiway system as a whole. And they're moving through the entire multiway system. They're not just moving through a single branch. They're perceiving essentially all branches of history. Okay. So... You might think, okay, well, such an observer couldn't possibly, you know, such an observer would, would, would go insane, right? They couldn't possibly reach any <laughs> definite conclusions about what was going on. They couldn't have a single persistent notion of time. They couldn't make any kind of consistent statements about, about reality. But then, okay, then what I came to realize is, well, if you look at, you know, these individual multiway branches, at least locally, the differences in the structure of the hypergraph that separate two multiway branches are quite small, right? They're, 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 they might be at the level of a, of a single hypernode or a small collection of hypernodes or something. Certainly far, far below anything that you'd expect an observer, a, macros a big macroscopic observer, to be able to, to, to distinguish, right? Yeah. If I show you two pictures of the universe where I've, you know, permuted a couple of hyper edges here or there, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between those two. Yeah. So what I realized is that a sufficiently macroscopic observer is effectively going to be coarse-graining their description of the, of the underlying hypergraph. They're not seeing the micro yeah. details of the hypergraph. They've got some coarse-grained picture in terms of space-time and, 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 and you know, these continuous structures. So the observer is really imposing a coarse-graining. And how do you actualize that coarse-graining? Well, that coarse-graining really just means that you're imposing a certain set of equivalences between different branches of the multiway system. You're saying the hypergraphs on these branches of the multiway system are distinct, but they differ at a level that's so small that to the observer, they are the same. So the observer is imposing some yeah. equivalences. And you can actualize those equivalences as what are called completion rules. So these are rules that effectively, these are rules that are not part of the evolution of the universe. They're kind of fake rules that the observer is imposing that let them effectively jump from one branch of history to another. They're kind of, they're sort of two-way rules that right. enable them to jump between the two, that tangle the branches of history together. Yeah. Those rules are a way of formally encoding the statement that, to the observer, these branches of history are the same. They can't yeah. tell the difference. Well, what I was able to show was that if you add enough of these completion rules to the system, then you could take any arbitrary multiway system and you could make it equivalent to one that was causal invariant. So in other words, that any arbitrary non-causal invariant multiway system could be reduced to one that was observationally equivalent to a causal invariant one, so long as the observer performed a, a sufficient amount of coarse graining, so long as they added enough of these completion rules. So that had one very nice consequence, which is it meant that it allowed us to study multiway systems without having to worry about whether they were causal invariant or yeah. not, because we knew that the observer could impose causal invariance post hoc, you know, whatever yeah. happened. But the other really nice and somewhat unexpected feature is it turned out to give us quantum mechanics in the following way. <laughs> so yeah. one of the reasons why quantum mechanics is considered to be sort of philosophically somewhat unpleasant and, and why it's still considered to be kind of an, an incomplete theory is because there's a distinction made between evolution and measurement. So evolution, which is how a quantum system evolves through time, is performed yeah. by applying these so-called unitary operators, these operators where if you take a conjugate transpose or whatever, you, you, you get the time reversal. But then measurement is this sort of mysterious and somewhat magical procedure that you do at the end, yeah. where you then take your pure quantum system that's been evolving according to the Schrodinger equation, you know, it's just a, a, a pure kind of superposition of, uh, of, of, of eigenstates, and then you apply not a unitary operator, but what's called a Hermitian operator, an operator with a different set of algebraic conditions that say, now if you take a conjugate transpose, you don't get the time reversal, you just get the same thing back. And then that performs a measurement and that collapses the wave function and you recover a single eigenstate with some classical probability associated with it. 
And so somehow quantum mechanics has tended to make this distinction between the time evolution, the unitary evolution, and the measurement, the application yeah. of the Hermitian operator. Well, in the multi-way system, there's actually a very natural encoding of these things. So the application of the conjugate transpose operation, this adjoint operation, is effectively like just flipping the orientation of an evolution edge. So if you've got an evolution edge from A to B, you just flip it around so now it goes from B to A. So for the edges that evolve you down the multi-way system, if you apply this inversion operation, you get a time reversal. So they basically, algebraically, they act like unitary evolutions. These completion rules that the observer imposes that allow you to hop from one branch to another, they're symmetric, right? You can go from branch A to branch B and branch B to branch A. Yeah. So if you apply the adjoint operation there, you get the same thing. And so they act effectively like Hermitian operators. And we were able to show, and this is in the series of papers that I wrote immediately prior to the launch of the physics project, I was able to prove that the algebra that you get out from considering these unidirectional edges that evolve you forwards in time and these bidirectional edges that map between the different branches of history, which are crucial for giving you this kind of observer-imposed causal invariance, their algebraic properties are the same as the algebraic properties of the unitary and Hermitian operators that you get in quantum mechanics. And so there's a well-defined sense in which you can say these completion rules that the observer adds to coarse grain out these different branches of history and make their causal structure equivalent, there's a well-defined sense in which you can say those completion rules are isomorphic to quantum measurements. And so that imposition of those coarse grainings or those completions becomes a kind of actualization of the process of quantum measurement. So not only does it reproduce the mathematical formalism of quantum mechanics, but it also kind of gives you a physical explanation for why that measurement operation happens, why the wave function collapses. It's not that anything magical is happening. It's just that the apparent wave function collapse is a consequence of the macroscopic nature of the observer and the fact that the observer can't, you know, you've got the superposition of these different branches of history, but because they differ on scales that are much smaller than the observer can macroscopically measure, the observer imposes an equivalence between them that treats them as being sort of the same, at least up to their causal structure. And that imposition of the equivalence that collapses the multi-way system down to just a single thread is the collapse of the wave function. And so this very pragmatic way of trying to avoid having to do systematic searches for causal invariance accidentally gave us a formulation of quantum mechanics. That is fantastic. <laughs> that's amazing. So so just to be clear, that's that's always possible to take a system that's not causally invariant, and if you get at a high enough level of observation, you can always reduce it to a causally invariant system? It's always possible with a very significant footnote. So one problem is when you add these completion rules, they enable you now to reach new states of the system that maybe you couldn't reach before. Yeah. So the observer can see, effectively, in the observer's perception of the world, they can see multiway states that maybe were not permitted in the original, you know, pure formulation of the multiway system before they imposed the completion. And that's okay. In fact, you can show that if you want to reproduce phenomena like, say, quantum interference, those kind of spurious observer-produced states are the essence of phenomena like quantum interference and quantum tunneling and so on. So it's important that they exist, but it comes with a rather negative side effect, which is if you want to collapse the, the multiway system down to something that's purely causal invariant, then every time you get a branch that doesn't resolve, you need to add some completion rule that resolves that branch. But those completion rules can introduce new branches, right? Because they can introduce new states that weren't previously reachable. And so you can end up in the rather undesirable situation where each completion rule you add to resolve one branch creates two new branches. Right. And then that procedure won't ever terminate. So eventually yeah. it will terminate. It will eventually terminate once you essentially exhaust the complete rule or multiway system for that hypergraph signature, which is trivially causal invariant. So there's a sense in which, yes, okay, eventually if you keep on adding completion rules ad infinitum, you will get something causal invariant, which is why I say, yes, it's guaranteed you can always do it. Yeah. You can't always do it in a finite number of steps. And in order to be kind of physically plausible, you need to be able to do it in a finite number of steps. Thanks for listening to The Last Theory. Join me for fresh insights into Wolfram Physics every other week. Subscribe to the free newsletter, podcast or YouTube channel at lasttheory.com. After all, this might be the most fundamental scientific breakthrough of our time.